My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Hey, it's Bill Thomas from Mind Over Murder. My co-host Kristen Dilley and I, as part of our celebration of the first 100 episodes of Mind Over Murder, have gone back and taken a listen to some of the early episodes with various guests that we thought were particularly worth a second listen. In this series of bonus episodes, we're going to be going back and taking a listen to some of our podcasts from earlier in our 100 episode history. This week, we feature a couple of episodes with CSI writer-producer David Rambo. We hope you enjoy these encore editions of Mind Over Murder mixed in with our new episodes currently covering the Colonial Parkway murders. Thanks, as always, for your support, and we hope you enjoy. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Bill Thomas. And I'm Kristen Dilley. Today, we are joined by David Rambo, who, in addition to being an American writer, playwright, actor, and producer, is also an old friend. Well, maybe it's not the right word. How about a a, a friend of some duration? What do you like that? I (laughs) like. Well, welcome to Mind (laughs) Over Murder, David. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Kristen. It's a real pleasure to be talking with you today. We are so thrilled to have you on. Can you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about your professional background, particularly how you got involved as both a writer and a producer on CSI? Well, sure. I mean, I didn't start out to be a crime writer. Uh, I actually started out to be an actor and a musician. I'm from a part of rural Pennsylvania, just outside Philadelphia, not that far from New York City. And uh, as soon as I was 18, I packed my tap shoes and left the farm and went to New York. And I had, you know, some modest success as an actor and as, believe it or not, a bar pianist in some of the theater district piano bars for many years. And then I came to California to uh, find television work as an actor. And I I did fine. I starred in a pilot for ABC, did some commercials and things. And I, I didn't love it. And I did love the theater and I wanted to keep writing. So I got a day job that would allow me to uh, work in the theater and try give me so I thought free time in order to to start writing maybe writing plays. Uh, I went into real estate and for 14 years, <laughs> man, I sold lifestyles the rich and famous. I had a wonderful time in LA real estate, but I had a, I had when the market was bad, I had a lot of free time, and that's when I started writing plays. And one of those plays eventually got produced, and I was able to stop selling real estate. It was produced nationally, and it's that play that led me to CSI. It was produced at the Geffen Playhouse. And here's where CSI and Rambo intersect. After three years of working with television writers, the star of CSI, William Peterson, played Gil Grissom, missed working with his theater world. He'd come from Chicago theater originally. So he called his buddies at who were now running the Geffen Playhouse in Los Angeles and said, do you have any playwrights You know who want to get into television? They gave him three names. I was the third name. The first two on the list were Pulitzer winners, who I heard later declined to drive to Santa Clarita for the meeting. Well, Santa Clarita is about just, and Bill will know this well, just outside the 30 mile radius that governs film production in LA. So if a production is just outside the 30 miles, you can have more non union people on your crew and things like that. So they were filming out in Santa Clarita which was a really good double for a lot of Vegas, both the subdivisions and the countryside around it. And we met and they liked me. They liked my plays. And the next thing I know, I was being asked to write the episode that became Butterfly, my first CSI episode. And that went really well. The fans loved it. And I spent the next six years on staff after that. The, the 30 mile zone as they call it in Los Angeles, and of course, uh, that's where David and I know each other from, actually impacted your 
career in terms of transitioning from playwright to television writer? I sometimes think if CSI had been filming, say, at CBS Studios in Studio City, maybe those Pulitzer winners would have gotten the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad they were in Santa Clarita. And I loved it because, you know, the days in television start very early. Mm -hmm. So you'd get up often very early and you'd get up, you know, four or five in the morning and drive out to this beyond suburbia sometimes to our locations, the canyons where we had crime scenes. There were a lot of them out there. And I just, I always felt, even going to our stages, that we were, this is what it was like when Hollywood was young. And the whole town looked like the little scrubby parts at the edges of Santa Clarita. It was really, and then you'd drive back at night after everybody else was home and it was against traffic. It was, it was great. I loved it out there. But we did move to Universal Studios the third season that I was on the show. And that's where the show stayed until it, it's uh, less full season. During those first two seasons, people talk about the writer's room. Was there actually mm -hmm. a place where the writing staff met and where was it? Absolutely. Both at Santa Clarita and in at, when we were at Universal, we had the equivalent of a large conference room with whiteboards on as much wall space as, as we could get. And the dry erase whiteboards were where we would write all the story beats as we worked out the stories. They were constantly being erased and rewritten. They were photographed at the end of every day. So in case the cleaning people wanted to help us out by giving us fresh boards, Oops. we didn't lose our episode <laughs> idea. <laughs> they were long days. We often, you know, we'd show up to start at around 10 and often it was midnight before we left the room. These are not easy stories to work out. By and large, my favorite episode that I wrote actually came together very, very quickly over about a 20 minute lunch. Uh, the showrunner, Carol Mendelson, and I worked the story out. But uh, in, for most of the episodes, almost all of them, it was weeks and weeks of, of going through every single story point, every character's arc, every piece of forensics that we could use. What's the new technology? You know, what devices are the manufacturers asking us to use in the lab? Uh, how can we relate that to the story we want to tell? It, 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 it was very intricate. And, you know, Kristen, as a longtime viewer and fan, you know, the episodes often had three or four cases that were yes. being solved throughout the 43 minutes of screen time that we had. Yeah, I was, uh, I was rewatching one last night. And one of the points that I wrote down was, holy cow, that's a lot of medical jargon. So I, I know you had to have spent quite a lot of time just trying to comb your way through, like even just the dialogue for, say, Doc Robbins and, and uh, David Phillips. Which one was it? I'm dying to know. Do you know? Do you uh, it, uh, Sin City Blues. Oh, that's the one. The Dr. Jekyll case. I, yeah, I got, well, the faux Dr. Jekyll case. We got, I got uh, Lawrence Fishburne to say idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. <laughs> looking at the dead kid. That was the part of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. How many times Actually, did that take? <laughs> well, it must have taken yeah, a couple inside, of takes, I imagine. <laughs> Here's the inside baseball. I had idiopathic thrombocytopenia. It hit me when I turned 41. I was still selling real estate and trying to get my plays produced. And it land, it, what it is, it's basically a viral form of hemophilia. You wake up one morning, you're a hemophiliac. It, who knows? It, it, idiopathic means they don't know where it comes from. So you know, I was bleeding from my nose and my gums. And if I touched my skin, I'd leave a bruise. It was, it's very, very dangerous illness. And I, you know, could have died very easily from it. I was hospitalized for a week. And it was that week that I, in that in Cedar sinai thinking, you know, what am I going to do if I get out of here? I've got to have a happier life. And I thought I got to make my living as a writer. And it took a couple, two more years before I could do that. But it really, it was a huge turning point in my life. I always wanted to use it, but I didn't have the right cases. We started talking about Dr. Jekyll and let's do a case where you think it's Dr. Jekyll, but it's not. And I said, have I got an illness for you? <laughs> <laughs> so real life intruded into the, into the storyline in a really cool way. Yeah. 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 And Fishburne just looked at me like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I remember <laughs> that day. And any time he passed me on the set before we got to that part of the dialogue, he'd look at me and he'd say, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. 
followed by two <laughs> syllables that I cannot repeat. Right. In that in that beautiful speaking voice. <laughs> oh, one of the great voices of cinema and stage. Oh, for uh, for sure. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. So, you know, part of the the writing process I know is is you know, having to balance out what is what is true to life about what a, a real CSI does and um, what Hollywood CSI ought, ought to look like. Um, because you do have to make it kind of glamorous and accessible to the watcher as well. So what are, um, what are some of the big differences that you found between real life CSIs and then Hollywood CSIs? First of all, uh, thank you. that's a great question because I love the real life CSIs. So many of them reached out to us from across the country. And uh, we had several at our disposal as either technical advisors or uh, actual producers in the room with us. Most of them came from the LA Sheriff's Department of the County Crime Lab. And they had worked some major cases, the Menendez case, the O.J. Simpson case, Hillside Strangler. We had some tremendous experience. And uh, we had one who was one of the DNA experts who came, he was a serologist who uh, went into DNA as DNA became uh, more and more a forensic tool, you know, not just diagnostic. So we were very lucky to have them to know what was real. On one of our field trips to the crime lab, which we did annually, <laughs> here's, here's the difference. A woman came in who was a fingerprint expert. And fingerprint experts are a very special breed because they spend all day looking at fingerprints but they have kind of a superpower for it. They can, they can see small differences in the ridges and the whorls that you or I wouldn't see if we looked at it for two hours. They can see it almost right. They're just amazing people. I love them. But this woman dressed comfortably, shall we say, and her hair looked like maybe it had been washed a week or two ago, and she had a cigarette hanging off one lip. And she was just <laughs> shuffling in, saw all of us, and she said, I hate you guys. We said, well, you know, why? 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 <laughs> Because you make my husband think I should look like Marg Helgen. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> There's, so we, we, there are three big differences between what a real criminalist does in real life and what our, our guys did. The first cheat is that our guys dressed very fashionably. Yeah, they, no so, kidding. Especially yeah, <laughs> the women often wore shoes and boots you'd never wear to a crime scene. The hair is quite, quite pretty. They look beautiful. Right. Uh, they were still very serious about the work, but they did look beautiful. That's the first cheat. The second cheat is time. Most cases on the show were solved within the, the story span of one or two shifts at work, like right. one or two days. That never happens. I mean, it just never happens <laughs> in real life. And we cheated in, on, as the time cheat. We also, there were a couple of processes that we would show. For instance, the phenothaline test for blood. Mm -hmm. uh, presence of blood is a three-step test. We would do it in two, just so our audience wasn't watching. That extra droplet of, of fluid hit the swab before it would turn pink or not. DNA results came back very quickly. On yeah, no show. kidding. <laughs> uh, now, you know, they have mobile DNA labs that can give you the DNA within an hour preliminary. Uh, but then it took, at the time, I think it was taking eight to 10 days to get the preliminary back. And this is, we're going back about 15 to 17 years now from my experience on the show. The show premiered 20 years ago. So time is the big cheat. And then the third big cheat that we did was uh, if we were showing the audience something that a criminal did on the show that, for instance, making a bomb, we would leave out one key element. So if someone was oh, okay. trying to recreate, some crazy person out there might be trying to recreate, you know, how to build a bomb. Kristen, you may remember there was one that I think involved white beans, a bomb that was, <laughs> I'm trying to yes. remember. It was, they tested it on the roof of the crime lab, which is actually the roof of the writer's parking structure at Universal Studios. Um, <laughs> another, <laughs> another cheat. <laughs> exactly. We used some vegetable in it where that would never have happened just because we didn't want people okay. going out, you know, and building CSI bombs and suing CBS for it. Although it's funny, we know a number of real life CSIs as you do too, David. And from talking about the colonial parkway murders and other cases, and even 
with the workarounds that you all created, we have had experts say to us that criminals do actually learn from watching procedurals. If they watch carefully, they begin to understand Mm -hmm. how real life criminalists work and how, if they're careful, they may be able to take forensic countermeasures. That's the expression that some of our investigators have used. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good that's a good way to put it. Count, forensic countermeasures. I mean, criminals have always looked to this stuff to see. I mean, novels before television movies, they've always cop- been copycats of, of fiction. But the flip side of it is that CSI also showed law enforcement and communities what was possible in terms of having a crime lab and what a good crime lab should have. And uh, many of them did not. If you go to particularly smaller cities and small towns, once they saw what our guys had, they wanted better than, you know, the trailer that they were given that was parked behind the sheriff's office or having to go to the county lab, which was backed up and not always really well organized. I think the show, because it was such a phenomenal cultural event, it upped the game on both sides. And I think, you know, pretty fairly on both sides. I heard that all of the equipment in the CSI lab for the show actually worked. Is that true? Yep. It's all real. Manufacturers, of course, love to have it on. We never showed their logos, but we could show what, what their machines did. Yeah, it was all all real. And, you know, we had on-site technical experts showing us exactly how to use it. One of our friends, Jared Bradley, his specialty is the MVAC. And uh, he oh, was yeah. telling Bill and I about actually taking MVAC to CSI and placing it in the lab so that they could use it on a case that they were working on. I think it was season 13. I was watching an episode the other day and I, I threw, threw the pause button on it. I said, I think that's the MVAC. And they never actually name checked it. They never said this is the MVAC we're using it for, you know, for DNA. But I recognized it immediately. John Wellner was using it. And I thought, this is just the coolest thing. Like they actually took this piece of really excellent technology and they're, they're using it. How fantastic. And Jared has told us that then real life CSIs and crime labs will see something like the MVAC placed in a fictional setting. And, but they'll know the equipment is real and they'll say, I want one of those and because they see how the thing yeah. works and it, it's supposed to pick up 200 times more DNA. And obviously the MVAC is talked about on, on the news and when they break cases using that technology, that's all really important. But it's funny, Jared told us that it's actually very important to get equipment like that featured in a fictional story that shows how a real life crime lab could use this to solve a crime. Wow. We not only had that effect, we had when we would meet with these manufacturers and see the devices, that would lead to story for us. What kind of story can we tell where this device or this process or this uh, chemical that you've come up with can change the story, can point to the suspect or uh, invalidate everything we thought so far and lead us down a new path? were lots of instances where we do whole episodes just to use the one gizmo in the one scene. <laughs> we were very I, excited by it. Yeah, it's like, well, hey, cool new gizmo. Let's write that into a exactly. show. Christmas morning, yay. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. Yeah, Talk to us a little bit about the story arc. So would you have some larger elements written out for a series of shows? Because one of the things they say about about CSI is that it's a show that you can sit down and enjoy just on an episode by episode basis or yeah, or you uh, can watch it every single week and and you can see longer story arc also occur. Yeah, it's a combination of serialized and closed-ended stories. When when I was on the show initially and I was there seasons 4 through 10, which roughly is the fall of 2003 to the spring of 2010. We generally did a closed-ended story in each episode, but character arcs for our regular characters were serialized throughout the season, <laughs> um, depending on who they were. You know, in the early seasons, Warwick's gambling addiction was a mm-hmm. recurring story point. Catherine's relationship with her father uh, yeah. really took off the years that I was on the show. I loved the stories. I wrote a lot of them. I, <laughs> I wrote the story where he got killed. 
the actor who played him, Scott Wilson, was not happy with me. Uh, no, no, not. <laughs> that was a great yeah. episode, though. Oops. <laughs> oh, thank you. I love that episode. I love that that whole death and the whole, uh, you know, cast. That episode, that's very interesting. We had a, we heard a story about a rape victim who came, I'm, I'm trying to remember the details. It was a female rape victim. And for some reason, the, the, they couldn't get a rape kit. And they had to gather evidence quickly. I forget exactly why. And I forget who brought us the story. But we said, well, what do you do? And she, the CSI told us the steps that, that she took improvising. I, I don't know who came up with the idea, if it was me or someone else. We thought, what if in this season premiere, Catherine Willows, our leading lady, Mark Ellenberger, had to do a rape kit on herself, improvised. Yeah. What could we, where could we put her that she would wake up, not sure if she had been sexually assaulted, but know that she had to collect evidence before she did anything else? And it was one of the, just a tour de force acting job for Marg. Marg was superb playing all that. But if you recall, Kristen, that episode introduced John Mayer's song, Waiting on the World to Change. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say she was with <laughs> Nick at the John Mayer concert. Yeah. That was, that exactly. was excellent. Exactly. And boy, did Marg, did Marg connect with John Mayer. She came to the writers <laughs> and she, she never brought us story ideas. She had ideas for how John Mayer and Catherine Willows could encounter one another again, maybe get stuck in an elevator or maybe she just dreams about him. <laughs> and these wonderful things. She, <laughs> or maybe have an affair. Oh yeah. Why exactly. not? Exactly. <laughs> he was so charming. He charmed everybody on the set. Yeah. I was going to say, and John Mayer has a little bit of a reputation as a guy with the eye for the ladies. And oh, that was the height of it. Yeah. So, did they Settled actually do scenes together? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we filmed. It was a little club in Van Nuys, a little low ceiling club. Bill, you probably went there to hear bands at different times back in the day. Uh, I probably I did. What it was called. It was on Victory Boulevard, and uh, we, you know, CSI or our department went in. Made it look so so glamorous and nice, and Ken <laughs> even Fink though it's a, it was a, a scruffy club, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can do a lot with light. And you know, while I'm on that, it is a show that changed the look of crime television. Yeah. Jerry Bruckheimer asked for uh, feature television. He hadn't done much television, and he he he, he wanted if he was going to do this show, he wanted it to look like a feature film. His direction to the director. Danny Cannon and uh, cinematographer Michael Barrett of the pilot was, I want you to create an image that when I'm at home flipping channels and this comes on the screen, it looks so different that I can't turn it off. So we were one of the first shows that started using uh, fluorescent lighting on screen, uh, the mm -hmm. cool fluorescence. And, you know, our crime lab was the night shift. So the lights were always on. And right. The org was that blue green. Yeah. The crime lab was that kind of gray green. It was, it was really quite beautiful. It had sort of a color palette to it. Yeah. Very distinct. And it's funny. I saw on social media the other day that you and Ted were saying, you know, with this whole social distancing, hanging out at home, <laughs> watching TV thing, yeah. <laughs> you had some photographs up on the big screen in what looks like your living room. You're right. We would know it was the show just from a, a still. Yeah. Yeah, that was in my den. I was watching Butterfly again. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, I'm proud of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweet this or Facebook it, whatever. So I took a snap and put it up there. Yeah, it was very distinct look. That, I believe, was a morgue scene, if I'm not mistaken. Well, everything was a lot more glammed up in, in CSI world than I think. Well, it's funny. We were talking about this beforehand. We've met some real life CSIs, and and uh, we had Cheryl McCollum on, who's a CSI in mm. Atlanta. Yeah. It's absolutely wonderful, and you know she's talked to us about about the impact that the show had in terms of uh, for the for the good. But then she also said she always feels kind of underdressed when she shows up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we heard uh, we had a coroner's investigator, wonderful woman, come and talk to us. I remember like season six, I think. And she told us that she goes to thrift shops and buys very inexpensive clothes that she keeps in the trunk of her car. She gets called to a scene where there may be heavy decomp or there's a lot of fluids, things like mm -hmm. that. This is a woman with small kids at home. She would change into the thrift shop shoes and slacks or whatever so that when she got home, she could 
strip down in the garage, put those clothes right in the trash bag and never see them again. And stuff like that, we didn't really do on our show. We did the jumpsuits. But yeah, you know, attire is a, is part of the job. The gloves, the masks, the head covering, it's all important because, you know, decomps swirling around. I think someone described it as little droplets of oil that can get in your eyebrows here. You remember there's an early episode where Sarah comes home from a really mm-hmm. nasty scene and she takes the shower with lemons. Yes, she has to use the lemons to get it out of her hair. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the real life CSIs, they like a lot of what we did with the show and a lot of them have issues with what we did with the show, but it did make their profession become much better known. And I'm particularly proud that I, I don't know the source of the statistic, but it was quoted to me when I started in season four, that by the season four premiere enrollments that fall uh, in college criminal forensics courses had gone up by 400% since the shows premiered. And the majority of the increase came from young women. I don't doubt it. I really don't. Because it did highlight a fascinating area of science with all kinds of advances during the time that you all were creating the show. And then, as you said, mm-hmm. you were incorporating those new advances into the story as you went along. Yeah, and sometimes technology, we'd hear about it in the middle of preparing an episode. Quick, write a new scene. Use that new thing. So Let's with, get the manufacturer. Let's get a demo. Yeah. So with the technical advisors, you know, who were real-life CSIs, correct? Mm-hmm, yeah. Would they hip you to those kind of things? In other words, oh, there's this new thing or this new technique that we're using? They would. We often, though, most often heard about them from our two researchers, who both were actors playing roles on the show as well. Mm-hmm. They had this great research business, and they were giving us all the research and when we needed to, well, one of them started very early. David Berman became the coroner's assistant in one of the early episodes. And his business partner, John Wellner, was also a researcher who eventually played the tox tech, Henry Andrews, on the show. Both terrific actors and the nicest guys in the world. But the man, they knew, they reached out to all these guys and found all these things for us. That was very cool. Up with, yeah, coroners. They, we, I remember... They took us uh, once the coroner and at national coroner's convention was in Los Angeles. <laughs> they wanted them to take us to dinner with a few medical examiners. So, okay, let's go. And we went to a very fancy downtown LA restaurant, steaks, you know, all this bloody red stuff on I was going to say, how bloody were the steaks? <laughs> <laughs> and we, the writers, we could not help but talk shop. We wanted to ask them. We're talking autopsies and cutting. And, you know, we, and then we kind of noticed, like one by one, the <laughs> tables around us got very quiet. People paid <laughs> checks quickly and got out. <laughs> Who are those guys? And I don't want to be sitting next to them anymore. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a night. But the, the really, a lot of it came from the researchers. They were terrific. And so David Berman and John Wilner then also had recurring roles. So they played characters that would show up, not necessarily in every episode, but then they, they also had this research business where they would be cueing the writers in terms of developments, new techniques, that kind of thing. It's very interesting. Yeah, I think they both, eventually their characters became regular characters. I know David Berman's did, and I think John's might have as well. Mm-hmm. I was going Yeah, for the last that. three seasons, they were credited as feature players, yeah. So the CSI effect, full disclosure, mm-hmm. I hear about the CSI effect in my sister Kathy's unsolved murder as part of the Colonial Parkway murders today, sure. where I'm talking to the real-life FBI agents who are the lead investigators in my sister's case, and we're looking into the Colonial Parkway murders, and they talk about the CSI effect. When did you first start hearing that expression, CSI effect? When, was this back when you were working on the show? Uh, yeah, uh, in, in even a little before. I'm married to a trial attorney. My husband started as a prosecutor in Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm, not, later did tr- I'm not sure we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, later did trials with the uh, L.A. City Attorney's Office out here. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. Many of you know that Authram is leading the way in DNA testing, helping law enforcement solve missing persons, homicides, and sexual assault cases across the United States and Canada using forensic-grade DNA tests. 
You can help this important cause by contributing funds and your DNA profile to Othram's free site, dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just choose simple steps. Now DNA Solves has added another new feature, DNA Solves Connect, which will allow you to upload your DNA profile to help law enforcement, even if you've never used one of the commercial genealogy sites. If you're looking for a missing family member or have lost touch with someone, DNA Solves Connect is an incredible option at only $14.95. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. Join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. It generally the CSI effect is is thought to favor the defense that somehow the criminalists did not produce or find or look for bother to look for the kind of evidence that the CSIs on television were able to get and therefore there was insufficient evidence so we have to acquit. I'm not saying that never happens. I also know that when Ted was starting to do trials in Brooklyn, it was the Perry Mason effect. They'd always say to the juries, the defense would always say. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this isn't going to be like Perry Mason where somebody gets in the stand <laughs> and says, all oh, right, I did it. Yes. <laughs> and Ted, in, in fact, Ted was a very successful prosecutor. He did a lot of very tough felony cases, mafias, gangs, arsons, just ugly stuff. He'd get up and say to the jury after the defense opened, say, well, ladies and gentlemen, would it be all right if this is a little bit like Perry Mason? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> They'd lean forward. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, I've been on jury. I've been excluded from juries because in voir dire, you know, they start talking about the CSI effect. And yes. then they ask you what yeah. you do for a living. And when I tell them, uh, excuse. Yeah, we don't but want it- this. We don't want this Rambo <laughs> guy explaining how the science works to the rest of the jury. <laughs> Exactly. I don't blame them. But to the to the uh, on the opposite side of that of that seesaw, that pendulum, CSI also has a enabled crime labs to get the resources they need Agreed. to gather more evidence, to dig deeper, to take that DNA swab or to test the styrofoam cup or something for DNA where they never would have before. Well, and I think it actually ways. it schooled people, including uh, investigators and crime labs. And as you said, maybe in, in Los Angeles or other major cities where there's a significant amount of resources, although resources are a challenge everywhere, but then also mm-hmm. in smaller cities and towns across America that were trying to solve cases, they saw that there were opportunities, scientific opportunities that might be helpful to them. Exactly. Exactly. It, it really raised the bar on both sides. And, and I'm very proud that we had an impact like that. I'm very proud that people related to the characters. You know, if they don't relate to the characters, no matter how good the story is, they're not going to watch every week. The characters are created by Anthony Zyker, who created the show. And he created the show because he played poker with the Vegas CSI from the night shift, a guy named Daniel Holstein. And he would hear about Daniel talking about his cases. In fact, this is weird. And let me bring it full circle. I live in a beautiful section, old part of Los Angeles, up in the Hollywood Hills. One night, we heard a window breaking, and I raced out, and there was some guy. I raced out on the little sleeping porch, it's like a balcony, and I looked down, and there's a guy on the, on the parapet below breaking my dining room windows, screaming that he's coming in to kill us. And we, wow. of course, called the police, and I distracted him enough for the police to get there. And <laughs> one way I kept him from coming in the window was throwing flower pots from the sleeping porch that would crash below. <laughs> and he was high on something. I was going to say, there and snakes there are chemicals in here somewhere. We killed his granddaughter. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. They, the cops show up and they're LAPD did a great job, took them away, but they did not process the crime scene. They took no prints. They took no, there was blood everywhere. They weren't taking sample. I was furious. And by now I think I'd been on the show five or six seasons. So I was out there with, you know, oblique light and my camera making sure that I could get a clean photograph, at least of the, of the print he left on the windows. Things right. Like that. Right. So I call, Daniel Holstein in Las Vegas, and because we had the name of the guy at that point, and we found out that he had been tried in Vegas for a homicide. 
this crazy guy occurred. you're talking wow. about? This crazy guy. He had been yeah. tried for a homicide in Vegas. Wow. Where he and a, a guy who I believe was homeless got into an argument and killed him. Wow. was witnessed by another homeless guy. I should say he allegedly killed him because he was acquitted. But I asked Daniel if he could look into the case. He said, I don't have to. That was my case. The what, guy, what a small world. CSI, wow. was in, who inspired CSI, who became a friend of mine and an expert, was a witness in the very case of the guy who they later, years later, broke into my house in Los Angeles. And How this, weird oh a connection God. is that? And this this crazy guy, he didn't know you or Ted or... Nope. He nope. was just out of his mind insane I, or whatever. Yeah, he was on methamphetamine, we think. And by the way, I had to go face him in court. The day he was uh, his first, the, the, I think it was, uh, might have been a, a hearing. I, for, I forget what phase of the trial. It was early on, and it took months before we had a court date. And I yeah. got there, and I had to you know, get sworn in and look at this guy. And I'm pretty strong. I'll talk to anybody. I played you know, the piano in theater bars in New York. I've dealt with some <laughs> out-of-control people. <laughs> You think <laughs> looking at this guy completely different now because he wasn't high and he was in the prison scrubs and everything. But looking at him was terrifying. I felt my voice wavering. I felt my heart fluttering. It was a very it's intimidating experience. Yeah. Yeah. Did he recognize you as the guy that was dropping flower pots on his head? <laughs> he probably didn't. <laughs> I, I couldn't say. He, he, he took a plea that we had to agree to. Right. And, you know, that said, but you know, it intersected again with my professional life and with Daniel Holstein. Yeah. Wow. wow. I, well, and, and <laughs> it's amazing how, you know, you're, you're watching this whole thing unfold and the LAPD show up and, and do a good job and arrest the guy and so on. And at the same time, you're like, wait a minute, why isn't anybody processing this crime scene? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still have my crime scene photos. I'm very proud of them. I did a good job. <laughs> That's awesome. So you had said that, you know, Anthony Zykers came up with the concept for CSI after talking with a friend of his who was a, a CSI. So how many uh, or what percentage of storylines are actually based on real cases? The goofiest ones were almost always from real life. So like Theory of the Everything that was one. really based on real life? <laughs> I love that episode. All right. You're going to have to explain this for everybody else. <laughs> okay. The two of you are kind of it's inside a- <laughs> baseball here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There was this David, do you want to explain that season? one? Sure. I'll try. It's the goofiest thing. There was an episode, I think it was season eight, that was called The Theory of Everything. How did we come? Well, I heard a physicist, mathematical physicist from Columbia speak, a guy named Dr. Brian Green, about string theory. And he was doing these talks where he would bring a string quartet and try to explain string theory, which is a theory of you know the organization of matter in the universe. I'm not going to even try to explain it. But Brian Greene made it very, very understandable to the layman. And his book, The Elegant Universe, is still a fantastic read. It's right up there with some Stephen Hawking's books, Brief History of Time in particular. You know, the, it helps the layman understand this arcane thing. So I brought it in and I said, you know, I think Grissom would be fascinated by string theory. <laughs> so they said, yeah. great, great. What's the story? I said, I don't know, but everything's connected. And we started talking. We had read a real life story about a, a lawsuit where the widow of a man who had been struck by a taser, taser hooks and burst into flame was suing the sheriff's department for that happening when he was in custody. We thought, how can that happen? Well, it kind of can't, but it turned out that they were using a, he was soaked in alcohol and they were using a a type of pepper spray that actually intensified that. So when the taser hit, there was a flame and the clothes he was wearing burst in flame. Anyway, so that's that. So we started with that. And Chris, if you remember, it's one of my favorite teasers. We start by questioning a a suspect who Mm -hmm. is drunk, who is found by the side of the road talking in the middle of the night to a dead deer wearing a dress. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And CBS, by the way, would not let us show a dead deer in a dress. It had to be a tutu. They couldn't be a full (laughs) dress. I have no idea why. Wait, wait. This is a, this was a, 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 (laughs) standards and practices. uh, Yes. Which is, I have no idea. The TV censor 
department. <laughs> exactly. What? So we, we thought, okay, a deer and a tutu. And then we thought, okay, string theory, how do we, so what we created was a series of crazy events that spun off of that so that all, uh, several of the calls the team got that night turned out to all be related in a way that was metaphoric for explaining string theory. And we gave William Peterson a wonderful monologue at the end where he explains string theory and how that explains the connectedness of these cases. Well, and Peterson, Peterson had to be totally up for this because now we're going back to, you know, his theater background in Chicago and you were going to yeah. give you this big, you know, set closing monologue and you're going to explain string theory in a way that television viewers can understand. <laughs> yeah. He loved it. I mean, he, you know, Billy, his, his his nature is to sort of look at you and cock an eyebrow and say, I don't know if I'm doing that. <laughs> but then he does it. And it's he, time and time again, he would say, well, this is a two page monologue. I, I'm, you know, I don't know. I'll come up with something. I'll do I'll do my own version. Right. And he'd go off to his trailer and then we'd get on the set, director call action. And he would deliver it word perfect, exactly as I'd written it, making it so much better yeah. than I ever yeah. imagined. Yeah. It. And it put me through two hours of agony for nothing. Well, and the truth is, right. uh, when you're working with great actors, and you've had a fantastic opportunity over the course of your career to date to work with some amazing people, it is true, every writer that I know has said, when you put your words, at which you sweated for hours over, in the hands of someone like William Peterson, they can el even elevate the the work beyond what's written on the script unquestionably and that's what makes it so gratifying i love production i love being on the set and watching these actors and directors and and all of the artists you make sense of of what you put on the page we had the best team on csi and these episodes are so beautifully produced they really really hold up well and every department from the props, you know, that would get all the lab equipment or do some of the evidence we needed and, and create the crime scenes and our special effects people and visual effects and even hair, makeup, all the departments really were the best in the business. There's a reason it's still the most watched show in the world. This is so well produced. It was it was a treat. And that all started on the page. It was wonderful when one of, you know, makeup might come in and say, oh, I love this. There's a scar in a place I haven't put one before. And how pink should it be? <laughs> Just how nasty can uh, I make that look? Yeah. And always how much blood at the crime scene was a big deal because, you know, there's standards. I will say that when real life CSIs came to our to our sets, they were always impressed by how accurately we created crime scenes. And our tech advisors really wanted us to do that, too. There's some things you just can't show on network television, and we didn't. Sure. But we often made the audience think they were seeing it, even if we didn't put it there completely. There's that uh, Alfred Hitchcock suggestion of mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. than is actually visible on the screen. I think it's absolutely true. Even in television, was a much more intimate medium than Hitchcock worked in, in cinema. But you have to work hard to, to scare people uh, mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it's by suggestion. A lot suggestion. of distraction. Yeah. Yeah. And the way you do it, frankly, is creating characters they don't want to look away from, that they identify with emotionally. That's the way you, you hold their attention. Make the character care about the crime scene. Sure. And actually, you know, I was a big fan of, of the Grissom character. And one of the things that I always was struck by was the way he would geek out on the bug thing. And then, <laughs> yes. you know, talk about how, uh, you know, flies and other insects invade they first of all they're everywhere and then they invade scenes where dead animals or people or what have you are are there w within a remarkably short period of time and i learned all kinds of stuff about insects and how they will you know land on a dead body or what what have you mm -hmm. and grissom would talk at such great length about this stuff but it was very clear that he was just like completely geeking out on on the whole insect world and how that intersected with the work that he did well that was the whole thing he was a guy who could fall in love with bugs but couldn't tell the girl he loved that he loved her yeah he and well was such a great <laughs> <laughs> so who were some of your favorite 
uh, either actors or directors or just occasional guest stars to work with during your tenure on the show? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, the core cast, you know, when I watch some of the old episodes, the truth is I haven't watched them in years, except when I'm traveling and I see one come on in another country uh, dubbed in another language. I always try oh. to watch a little of that. <laughs> <laughs> <But I, laughs> <when>, El <laughs> libero questo posto, per favore. <laughs> si, el libero. Exact, <laughs> see, you know, in France, Catherine, you know, Mark Helgenberg's character has this deep chamorot type voice and brass <laughs> is the, the, the guttural guy from the South, the fisherman. It's very funny. <laughs> um, but when I watch them, I have such a, even actors who were such a pain in the ass on the day, I just, I, just, <laughs> I get a very sentimental feeling about them now. You know, you go up and down with these, with the cast, a regular cast. You see them more than you see your own family. You work 15 hours a day together. There's just no way everybody's going to be sweet and friendly and close quarters for that amount of time. So tempers sometimes flare, but also gratitude is there and uh, affection. And, and you have good moments with everybody, even, you know, the ones that you just think have mangled your dialogue, which does happen. But I always <laughs> loved writing, writing for and working with, Mark Helgenberger and Scott Wilson doing the story of mm -hmm. Catherine and her, her casino owner father. And when we went to cast her mother, we cast a Broadway, delightful Broadway actress, Anita Gillette. And uh, Anita and I are good friends to this day, actually, as a result of working together on the show. And I loved writing their scenes. Mark loved playing them. It was always so much fun. The guest stars, we had the best guest stars. We, I mean, I, I did an episode with Faye Dunaway, Oscar winner Faye Dunaway. This is one of the most... It's funny, I called a director friend who directed her on Broadway. And I said, I just cast Faye Dunaway, and there are a lot of strong feelings about Faye Dunaway. I said, what am I in for? He said, okay, I'll tell you two things. First off, everything you've heard is true. And secondly, <laughs> it'll be the most memorable experience of your career. And he was right, Faye. Faye was very hard on me at the beginning. She didn't want to talk to a writer. She didn't talk to the director. After her first fitting, we were... Um, she, she called me constantly and, and would had such great ideas and questions. And she, I've never seen an actor work harder on a guest role in television. She is always, she's so prepared, not always easy to work with. You know, this is in the press. I'm not telling tales out of school here, but she comes to the set so prepared. She knows what her character is thinking and feeling at every moment. You can cut away to her anytime and you get something that's alive and interesting. It's a really good acting lesson. I've shared that with other with young actors when I talk to them. I loved working with Tim Conway. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he did my last one. I always wanted to do the Sunshine Boys because we're in Vegas, you know, and Vegas yeah, yeah. for a time had these comedy teams. Right. Two guys that get up, you know, Burns and Schreiber, whatever. I always thought, wouldn't it be great to do the Sunshine Boys where one half of the team kills the other because he's not funny anymore? That's a cool idea. <laughs> <laughs> I could never figure out. It ended up being my last CSI after Very... seven seasons, and it's called Take My Life, Please. And but I'm uh, <laughs> Exactly. We had great guests. Jennifer Tilly was a guest star in that one, I remember. And oh, she's she hysterical. Tim Her Conway's voice. Wife. Oh, she's so great. It was a wonderful episode. And working with Tim was I mean, a dream come true. And we had Roger Daltrey of The Who. Wow. Who, you know, sang our theme, actually played multiple roles or a master of disguise. In I episode did, in yeah, I didn't know that. Season. Wow. Oh, that was so great. Ta you know, that's a rock star. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't there for some. Of, we had Taylor Swift when I was there. It was her first acting job. She yep. was lovely. Interesting. She and I are from the same part of Pennsylvania. And I had some time chatting with her mom about that. And hmm. How... The arts, the performing arts in particular, is so important where we came from. And look, you know, here I'm writing, producing CSI, and her daughter's the number one artist in the world. We had extraordinary opportunity, and we had some great feature directors. Martha Coolidge was one of the first feature directors who came to do the show, and then William Friedkin came in. And there were others. It was an uh, extraordinary opportunity for all of us who worked on the show. The well, I do have to ask about Tarantino. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Quentin Great Tarantino. Parts one and two. Yeah, yeah. Came in to direct. Love Quentin. I don't know. I, oh, I think I think Anthony arranged the whole Tarantino thing. Anthony Zyker. Small point. When Anthony was growing up in Las Vegas, creator of the show, one of his jobs was a bellman at, I believe, Mirage. And 
Tarantino was in the early part of his fame, come checking into the hotel. And Anthony was carrying his bags and said, Mr. Tarantino, I'm going to be a screenwriter. I'm going to work in Hollywood. And you and I are going to work together. I promise you. And Tarantino was very gracious, said, you know, I'd love to see that happen. Gave him a nice tip. Tarantino n- forgot about it. I'm sure he hears that all the time. The first day but that he Quentin was came gr- into he the was room, gracious, though, and that's important. <laughs> oh, always, always. Ta- Quentin's a gentleman. I never saw him as anything less than that. When uh, Quentin came to the writer's room, we were so excited. I'm getting excited remembering the day. <laughs> I mean, we were so excited. It was Quentin. It's the height of his fame. And Anthony came in the room and was just such a fanboy told him the story and to see what it meant to Anthony to have made that promise when he was young and to be that guy yeah. who made that dare who see his wish fulfilled was so gratifying. And Quentin had seen a TV movie that I remembered too from the early seventies where a girl was basically buried alive in a coffin and it was a race to get her before she died. Pay the ransom and find out where she is. I remember I had terrible dreams about it after I saw it. I yeah. Was really I, scared I've also statement. seen uh, at least two films that are kind of based around a similar thing. One called the vanishing, which is originally, yeah. originally a Dutch film, if I'm not mistaken, which was actually, I think one of the scariest things I've ever seen. It's a primal fear. And oh, it's yeah. our fear of death, of course. And it's also our fear of death after we learn what happens to us when we die. Sure. That bodies are put in boxes and buried. It's a, it's a childhood fear. Mm-hmm. But um, Quentin used that as the story, the starting point for the story. We all worked on it and it was a tough one to break, but we came up with a one hour episode. We started getting Quentin's dailies and they were timing very long, which means what we wrote to happen in 43 minutes was going to happen almost twice that. Right. It was just a feature pace of, of delivering, which every is shot. what he did. He made feature exactly. films, and, and he's he making one in his head. <laughs> he had directed an ER, I think, before, but he this, he was a huge CSI. He had all of our seasons on videotape at home. He taped them off the air. Very, he was very like Kristen Dilly of him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we realized this episode of in our show, Nick Stokes, played by George Eads, was the one buried in the box. And it's the race to get him. And it, he gave such a great performance. He's really oh robbed my God, he did. nomination for it. Uh, he was, it. I think it was the best thing he ever did on the series. I just love it. As we're filming it, we realize we need another hour. This is we, we're, we're creating a television event here. Quentin is creating. So we go to CBS and say, this is our season finale. We want it to be a two-hour finale. And CBS said, no, without a trace, has the hour after you, and it's their season finale. And they like season finales because they'd get their Nielsen's numbers up, which meant they could charge more for commercials. And we begged and begged and showed them some footage, and they finally agreed to it. But now we realized we still need about 12, 16 minutes of scenes. So, Kristen, I'm sure you know, there's some lovely character scenes, just like Nick and Warren yeah, talking in the locker room and uh, Greg and Hodges playing uh, a board game. Yes, Those that one was to, hysterical. To get two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so these are like outtakes, or did you uh, no, go back and do? No, they're in. They're in the movie. They're in the movie, and uh-huh. you can see it. And they're great scenes. They're fun, and they gave our so, you know our actors a chance to have character moments right. at the end of the season that didn't have to deal directly with a dead body. Well, when it aired, it was such an event. It was viewed by thirty-five million people. I don't think there's been a single episode of scripted television since. That's had that kind of an audience. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, and of it, course, it, the audience has struggling. fragmented even more than they than they were then. And you guys were at the absolute top of your game, and as was Tarantino. Yeah, and I mean, his footage is the episode. He cast such great actors. He loved. Uh, he always loved actors who'd been a little more famous previously. Yeah. So we had like Andrew Prine and Lois Childs and John Saxon. I think it was one of John Saxon's last roles. He was a huge name in the late 50s and the 60s and in the early he was married to Bo Derek for a long time. Well, yeah. it's funny. I w- just by coincidence, not preparing for this interview, but I was watching television last night and I finished watching the news I'd had enough and I was just mm-hmm. tuning by and I noticed that Jackie Brown was on. I had never oh, yeah. I'd never seen the movie. It's interesting. I it was a few minutes into it. So I was able to pick up the story pretty quickly. Uh That entire film is peopled with all sorts of wonderful actors who, I hope this comes out right, you know, their careers had peaked at some earlier point. 
And he, yeah. Tarantino chose these really, really interesting people from Pam Greer, who plays the lead character, all the way through. There were all of these great actors in, you know, good roles. I mean, it is Tarantino. It's kind of got a thing. but mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's his best film, but it was very interesting. It sort of made you smile because even in these small roles, they're really, really interesting experienced actors that were maybe hot in the 70s or 80s, done a lot of movies and television, but you mm -hmm. don't see them quite so much. They were all over this movie. and It, it, it was their fan. He, yeah, it, because he for all of them, he's their number one. He cast Robert Forster, who was a very good friend of mine, lovely guy. Yeah, uh, he cast Bob, and Bob got an Oscar nomination for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it, rather than to, he's definitely not uh, the director who's going to say uh, he wants the flavor of the moment hot actor. He he wants people that have the acting chops, but not necessarily as much visibility today but still have great ability yeah uh just because he worked in that video store you know he watched yeah. all of those yeah and hey. he just loved them join us again next week as we continue our conversation with writer producer david rambo and his adventures at csi thanks for listening to this episode of mind over murder as always your reviews and comments are extremely important We'd appreciate it if you'd give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast site. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. Mm -hmm.